A sermon for the sixth Sunday of Easter. <clears throat> the readings are Acts 16 verses 9 to 15 and John 14 verses 23 to 29. Well, if you read through the book of Acts, you'll find all kinds of exciting things going on. Thousands of people coming to believe in Christ, people being healed, even dead people being brought back to life. It seems as if Peter, Paul and the other apostles must have had a kind of hotline to God. And I admit I sometimes think it would be great to have something of what they had. I don't know about you, but when I'm struggling to make a decision, I often wish God would speak in a loud voice or point out the way in neon lights. And it seems as if something of that kind happened to Paul in our first reading, but maybe it wasn't quite so straightforward. Paul and his companions appear to be travelling towards Turkey. In fact, they'd already travelled about 200 miles on foot without any real certainty of where they were headed. Then it happened. Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia asking him to go and help the people there. This was totally unexpected. It meant going to Greece, heading into new territory. But because of his vision, Paul was certain that this was where God intended him to go. And when they arrived in Philippi, Paul's normal practice would have been to search out the local synagogue where he could share the gospel with members of the Jewish faith. But there wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. So Paul went just outside the town to the river, a place where he knew people gathered to pray. Here he found a woman called Lydia. Unusually for those times, she was a woman of independent means, a businesswoman who dealt in purple cloth which was at the very top end of the textile market. She was already a worshipper of God, rather than worshipping the false gods of the pagan world, and she opened her heart to receive Paul's message. She and her household were baptised into the Christian faith, and after this she opened her home to Paul and his companions, and they stayed with her. Lydia responded to God's presence in her life by showing generosity and hospitality providing a base from which Paul could carry out his ministry and a meeting place for fellow believers. When Jesus spoke to his disciples at the Last Supper, he told them, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. He promised them that after he left, the father would send the Holy Spirit to teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. And basically, this is what we see happening in Paul's experience. Paul is guided by the Holy Spirit to go to Philippi. The Holy Spirit opens Lydia's heart to receive Christ, and she responds in care for others. And we know from Paul's letters that a church flourished in Philippi, and that the people there were generous and sent gifts to him while he was in prison in Rome. The Holy Spirit often guided Paul and the other apostles in quite dramatic ways. But Jesus promised that God would make his home in all who love him and all who obey his teaching. He promised the Holy Spirit to all who believe in him as their Lord and Saviour. And Jesus tells us not to be afraid, not to be troubled, but to be at peace, recognising that he lives within us by his Spirit. Often in the book of Acts, we find people being filled with God's spirit at their baptism. And we, when we baptise someone in our churches, we pray for the spirit to fill them and to guide and renew them day by day. We recognise that for babies and children, as well as for adults, baptism is the first step on a journey of faith. And as our journey continues on, it's good to keep on praying for the infilling and guidance of the Holy Spirit in our own lives. And we can recognise that God's Spirit was certainly at work in Paul's life. But what does it mean for us? I doubt if I'm the only person who doesn't receive dramatic visions. But actually Paul didn't always see things as clearly either. Before they were called to go to Macedonia, we read that they were kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in Asia. They tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow them to. We aren't told how this happened, but something definitely stopped them from going where God didn't intend them to go. And perhaps you've had the experience of deciding to go somewhere or to do something 
and then you've had that feeling that you really shouldn't. Or maybe you've found yourself prompted to visit someone or give them a call and afterwards you've realised it was just what they needed you to do. God doesn't always communicate with us in dramatic ways. The Holy Spirit is a spirit of intimacy, drawing us nearer to God, helping us to understand the depth of his love for us, helping us then to love him and in doing so to love one another. He calls us to leave behind selfish attitudes and to serve one another, not to judge others, but to be compassionate and forgiving. The Holy Spirit is our teacher, helping us to pray, helping us to understand the scriptures, helping us to recognise when we might be straying away from God. I suppose the Holy Spirit can operate as a kind of divine sat-nav, guiding us, accompanying us on our journey. When you take a wrong turn in your car, you can hear a voice telling you to stop as soon as possible and turn around. And if you ignore it, it recalibrates and finds you an alternative route. Well, sometimes we can become aware of a feeling of unease, a sense that we're heading in the wrong direction, away from God. And if we listen, then his spirit can bring us up short and help us to find our way back to him. And as we recognise God's love for us, we can respond by living, loving him more and desiring to do his will. And we can also recognise that we can't carry out his will in our own strength. We need his inspiration and power, not just to go out and do things for God, but to be the kind of people he desires us to be, to have the strength to love and forgive those who wound us, to be open to those whose ways are different from ours. Jesus told his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Well, I'm sure we're all praying for peace in our world right now, especially in Ukraine. The terrible situation there has surely made us aware of just how fragile peace between nations can be and of the devastating effects of conflict. But I think Jesus is speaking of a different kind of peace, the kind that he can only he can give to us. And if we allow the light and presence of God to work within us, then we can be aware of his deep peace, even in the midst of difficult circumstances. And this peace isn't the absence of conflict. It isn't a nice warm glow inside, but maybe it's a feeling of inner stillness, a confidence that Christ is at the centre that he is with us and he is in us. It's a peace based on our trust in him, in his sovereignty, in his love for us and for all the world. And rather than making us complacent or self-satisfied, then it should stir us to pray for our broken world, to reach out to those in need, to do all that we can to draw others to experience the love, the forgiveness and the peace that our Saviour offers to all who turn to him. A prayer from David Adams. Lord Jesus Christ, who promised that in you we would find peace, give us that peace which the world cannot give, the deep peace of God which passes all understanding. In all our troubles and anxieties, keep us calm and hopeful. Grant that we may know that we abide in you and in your peace, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.